I'm part of a volunteer search and rescue organization and every year, our group takes part in a late summer retreat full of team building and bonding exercises. One of these exercises involves night training, which, as you can probably imagine, involves practicing our search and rescue skills after dark. My specific job title is SNR K9 Handler, which sort of encompasses why I joined in the first place. I always wanted to work with animals, I just never had the grades to study to be a vet. And so joining as a dog handler meant the best of both worlds. I could do something constructive and contributive with my spare time, all the while playing with dogs. I use the word play very loosely there, but you get the idea. Anyway, we were out on night exercises when my dog, who was trained to find human remains, started to alert us to a scent. I was partnered with a more senior member of the team at the time, but when I looked to them for some guidance, she basically said, let's just go with it. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, your dog picked up the scent of human remains. Why weren't you freaking out? Well, the answer to that is simple. Even the most highly trained cadaver dog gets things wrong sometimes, and in a place like Washington, where we get California's annual rainfall on a Tuesday, damp scents can often confuse HRD, or human remain detection dogs. So, when my dog started to alert, our policy was basically, just let him do his thing. Because best case scenario is a false positive, and the very worst case scenario, we find some previously unearthed human remains. Which, as horrifying as that'd be, was obviously a major part of our job. So the senior team member and I agreed to part ways temporarily. She'd wait on the trail, while my dog and I went off to follow the scent that he'd picked up. Since we both figured it was just a false positive, it would only be a matter of minutes before my dog lost the scent and then we'd be back on the trail and on our planned route before we knew it. But then, a few minutes turned into like ten minutes of walking through the dark woods, and then after my dog started to lead me down a fairly steep slope, I lost my footing and took a really nasty fall. The next thing I know, my chest is on fire, probably from the two broken ribs that I just sustained, and I could feel blood oozing from where I'd bashed my head on a rock on the way down. The first thing I did was press the emergency alert on my GPS, which signals base camp that one of the team needs assistance. The second thing I did was start calling out for my dog because I'd lost control of his leash during the fall, which I think scared him so bad that he ran off or something. That, or he just mindlessly followed the scent trail, thinking that I was still following close behind. As you can probably figure, I was not feeling like my best self. I was in agony, I was confused, and having dropped my flashlight as well as the leash during the fall down the slope, I couldn't see very well either. I just lay there, calling out for Brody, hoping that base camp had someone closing in on my position so I could get to the damned hospital already. I don't know exactly how long I was lying there before someone showed up, but when I heard footsteps getting closer and closer, I felt this wave of relief washing over me. I started to call out something like, I'm here, I think I broke something, assuming it was a fellow SNR volunteer, but the second I heard their voice, I knew that they weren't with our group. Like I said, we did all kinds of icebreakers and bonding exercises as every year there tends to be a couple of new volunteers, but the voice I heard that night didn't belong to a long-term team member, and it didn't belong to the new girl or new guy either as we only had two new faces on the team that year. It was a man's voice, and when they started talking instead of directly helping me, I swear it sent this chill of fright running right through me. The voice most definitely belonged to a man, and they started talking about how I was in a dry creek bed, one that dozens of people fall into every year. He went on to say that at least one person dies there every year thanks to the flash floods the place sees during the rainy season. Someone falls, they get stuck, and then they drown. I went from asking for help to literally begging for it, but the guy just completely ignored my requests and carried on giving his little speech about how often folks go missing or lose their lives out in that area of the woods. I remember losing my temper and asking what the hell was wrong with him, and when he replied was something like, you're not in a position to talk to me like that, 
I started to scream. Not wild screams of fright, but help, somebody help, over and over, while I tried and failed to reach for my flashlight. I also cannot overstate how goddamn painful that was, having to scream when doing so made the burning pain in my chest feel so much worse. And around about that time, I started to hear my dog Brody calling out for me. He's part Australian Shepherd and he's a very vocal dog, so I started to hear a series of awoos, trills, and rolled barks, all of which tended to mean, hurry your butt up, human. As soon as Brody started making those noises, the shadowy figure stopped talking. And then, as we both started to hear the sound of Brody getting closer and closer, I heard that guy's footsteps as he made a hasty retreat. I think maybe a minute or two later I start hearing more footsteps, only they're from multiple people that time, and they came with flashlights. I call out for help one more time, and the next thing I know, two of my fellow volunteers are walking up the creek bed, and one shines their flashlight right on me. My first thought was to tell them about the guy that had just been talking to me, the one that had talked about the accidental deaths in a way that made me think that they weren't so accidental. I know that might sound kind of crazy, but the way he talked about them, like those deaths made him happy, it was one of the creepiest encounters of my entire life. So yeah, I told my two rescuers about the stranger, and one of the first things they did before administering first aid was to make sure that he was actually gone. One guy shone his flashlight all around while the other started asking me, were you pushed? And both later said that they were scared that that creepy guy had been the cause of my injuries. Hence, one asked if I was pushed or not, and then asked if I was sure about that when I said no. But don't get me wrong. I was terrified that he was about to do something, especially since I was basically incapable of getting away from him. But he didn't cause me to slip. He was just there to see it, or maybe hear it. But that obviously raises the question of, what the hell was he doing out there in the first place? My two teammates then kept me company until the medics showed up with an ATV and a backboard that they could attach a stretcher to. I was then slowly driven back to base camp, given a quick look over, and then we headed over to a very rural medical clinic once we figured out my ribs were broken. Once I'd been given some pain medication and the doctors told my team leaders I was stable, everyone breathed a sigh of relief and a bunch of my fellow volunteers came to visit me in the morning to see how I was doing. And that's when I finally got a chance to tell everyone about the guy that had showed up in the minutes after my fall, and how his warning sounded an awful lot like thinly veiled threats. About a week later, after I'd been discharged from the hospital and I was safely back at home, I got a call from that same senior team member that I'd been with before my fall. She asked how I was doing, how my recovery was progressing and stuff like that, and she then told me that the team leaders were discussing a change of locations for the following year's retreat. A couple of other team members had reported someone walking around in the dark, someone who definitely wasn't a volunteer, and that after talking it over, they decided that safety was paramount and that they'd be looking at alternative locations. In the words of one team leader, a second run-in with that creepy, shadowy stranger was not something they were willing to risk. My name's Chris. I'm a longtime fan from Melbourne, Australia, and the story I've got for you actually involves you and your YouTube channel in a sort of roundabout way. I met my girlfriend in May of 2019, and it was her that introduced me to your videos. I'm not gonna lie. At first, I did think it was a bit weird that scary stories seemed to help her fall asleep, but after a while, I started to see the appeal and we'd often put on a video while doing the dishes after dinner. This became something of a long time ritual for us, then sometime in late February the following year, we were listening to some camping stories of yours when my girlfriend suggested that we pay a visit to the Wanangatta Valley. Wanangatta Valley is about a four hour drive out of Melbourne, and it's a fairly popular destination for hikers and campers. I know it probably makes us sound a bit mental to listen to a load of scary camping stories and then be like, well... That sounds like a good time, sign me up, but we're actually aware of how rare any kind of rural crime is. 
We didn't feel like we would be in any danger, and we weren't in all fairness. But then, at the same time, that makes what I'm about to tell you pretty bloody ironic. So we drive out to Wanangata and remember the exact date being the 21st of March 2020. We bought a load of camping gear online and we were looking for a good spot to pitch our tents when we came across a couple of other campers. They were standing just off the trail and about 10 to 15 meters away was a burned out utility vehicle and what looked like charred remains of a tent. There was a man and a woman there fairly young looking and the man was pacing back and forth with his phone to his ear looking majorly concerned. My first thought was that these guys had accidentally set their tent or ute on fire which had then caused the other to catch fire. God knows how they might have managed that but figuring out exactly what had happened wasn't the first thing on our minds, we just wanted to make sure that the couple was alright. As we're walking up the trail, the guy thanked whoever he was talking to on his phone and then just hung up just in time to greet us as we got closer. It turns out, it wasn't their campsite. They just had come across it at the same time as we did and figured they'd report it since it was obviously fresh. We could smell that charred kind of burn smell from all the way over on the trail, so he was right when he said that it must have been fresh. But the guy said that there was some untouched food lying around too, recently purchased stuff, which made him think that it wasn't just some dickhead teenagers looking to destroy the evidence of their last night's joyride. The bloke had actually been on the phone to the coppers right as we turned up, which was obviously the right thing to do, but since someone was already dealing with it, me and my girl just kept on walking after wishing the other couple good luck. It sounds crazy looking back on it, but at the same time, we didn't think there was anything sinister going on. What it looked like was that there had been some kind of horrible accident and someone was potentially hurt. There were no signs of a struggle, no blood or any other sort of human remains. It didn't look like what it was. Not long after we got back, my girlfriend sent me a link on Facebook to a local news story. The burned out ute and tent that we'd come across belonged to an elderly couple who had been out camping just like we had. But instead of getting the help that they needed, they hadn't shown up anywhere at all and they were still considered missing people. There was a big appeal for information so obviously me and the missus got in touch to offer our services, but to be honest, I'm not sure that we were of much help at all. We'd been in the valley for two nights but aside from the run-in with the couple and the burned tents, we hadn't heard or seen anything even remotely suspicious. And for a while we started to worry that the couple that we'd seen might have been in on it in some way. I mean, we just rocked up and asked if they needed any help and then walked off after a quick chit-chat. The bloke told me that he'd been on the phone with the emergency services, but I had no way of knowing that for certain. We'd mentioned them to the police when we called them, and they told us that they'd already talked extensively to the person who made the call. But they didn't tell us exactly when the call was made, and neither did they give us any details on the person that had made it. Spoilers, but... We really were just being a bit overly paranoid because the couple we bumped into had nothing to do with the missing people, and we found that out for certain about 18 months later when the bodies of the missing couple finally showed up. It was sad, and I hate to sound harsh here or whatever, but it wasn't really a surprise to me or my girlfriend. This poor old couple had gone missing after some kind of accidental fire had inflicted God knows what kind of injuries to them. It seemed like they'd gotten lost gotten hurt or even worse, then sadly they'd succumbed to the elements and passed away. I remember my girlfriend saying that like, say they'd been in the tent whilst it was on fire. They could have inhaled all kinds of nasty smoke on the way out, not to mention getting burned and then those burns getting infected or something. It was just an all-round horrible tragic way to go out and you really felt for the couple, but then the news broke that it hadn't been any kind of accident at all. The elderly couple had been murdered, and their ute and tent had been burned to get rid of any physical evidence their killer might have left behind. Knowing we'd come across the scene of a murder like that, and in complete ignorance too, it was chilling. According to things we read online, the murder had taken place not even 24 hours before we arrived. If we'd left the day before, we might have even seen them hanging around their little campsite, 
We might have even swapped a good day or two going past, or at the very best, maybe the trail being a bit busier might have saved their lives. It felt terrible for their families, for their friends, but at the same time, we couldn't help but wonder about the gorier details. Call it morbid curiosity, but my girl and I were pretty desperate to know what had happened to that poor old couple. I mean, we spent two nights in the valley after they were killed, so were we in any danger at all? Was someone just hunting people at random, or had it been some kind of personal thing? As it turns out, it was neither of those things. It wasn't some psycho serial killer stalking the valley for victims, nor had the killer and his victims ever laid eyes on each other before. The murders happened because of an argument that started over a bloody drone. The whole thing is going through the courts now, or at least it was when I had the idea to write this all up and send it over to you. I tell you to look it up for yourself, but it's as confusing as it is depressing. The killer's defense lawyers are saying that his victim pointed a gun at him and that he somehow managed to rush the guy, grab the gun, and then killed the elderly couple, both man and wife, before he burned all the evidence. He even burned their bodies too, and there's court testimony of him saying how he felt terrible for doing it, how he vomited from the smell, all this stuff trying to make him seem like a victim of the whole thing too. It's just gross, man. But anyways, all the best with your channel and all that, and best of luck in the future. I don't know when this bloke's going to be sentenced or whatever, but I hope it's for a bloody long time. Fancy killing someone over a drone. It hardly bears to think about. Patapsco State Park used to be one of my favorite places in the entire world. I grew up just outside of Baltimore in a place called Woodlawn. Some of you might recognize that name, but probably not for the best of reasons. I went to Woodlawn High School, same one that Adnan Syed and Hyman Lee went to, and the same one made infamous in the podcast Serial. For those of you not in the know, Serial was probably the first big true crime podcast, and it told the story of how Adnan supposedly murdered Hai Min, who was his girlfriend at the time she was killed. It cast a long shadow over Woodlawn, and Baltimore's reputation had been in the toilet ever since The Wire came out during my final year of middle school. I used to love both places, and I spent what's probably an embarrassing amount of time defending both in various online game lobbies. But then came the day when I was no longer able to defend Baltimore or the wider county, and that just so happened to be the day that I decided never to visit Patapsco State Park ever again. My girl and I decided to visit during the summer of 2014, as Patapsco has a ton of different places to camp that came with their own table and fire ring. I'd spent almost my entire life hiking and camping around that park, hence why it was one of my favorite places, and that also meant that I knew the place like the back of my hand like how I knew one of the most secluded and picturesque places to hike was between the river and the train tracks. He had this stretch of barely trodden trail right there next to the river and provided a train didn't roll past every so often, you might think it was a scene from a fairy story or something. Which is obviously why I was so excited on showing my girlfriend at the time, because I figured if I thought it was pretty, she would go absolutely nuts over it, you know? Anyway... We drive out to Patapsco, found ourselves a free campsite, then once we were all set up, we crossed the train tracks and started heading for the river. We're about 10 to 15 minutes into the hike. My girlfriend is absolutely loving the river and was taking all kinds of pictures on her phone when suddenly we heard voices from somewhere on the other side of the water. The river isn't all that wide, but since it was summer and all the trees and bushes were in bloom, we couldn't see who it was until someone suddenly burst out from the bushes and ran into the river. They looked scared, and as they were running, their foot must have caught on a rock or something because they suddenly just splashed down into the water in what looked like a pretty nasty fall. I was about ready to jog up the bank a little to see if the guy was okay and if he wanted any help, but then, right as I was about to take off, he stands up, turns around, and yells out, no, please no. And the next thing we hear is bang, bang, bang. Three gunshots. 
then the guy fell backwards into the river again. It was all over in a matter of seconds. We heard the voices, saw the guy fall, then he stood up and he was dead. But I swear I don't think his back had even touched the water before my girlfriend and I took off running. The split second we heard those shots, it was just a complete 180. Not in terms of the direction we ran, either. Everything was turned on its head. One minute I was the happiest I'd been for many, many months, and the next, we were quite literally running for our lives. I mean, I know it wasn't us getting shot at, but I figured if someone was willing to do that, they probably didn't want any witnesses to it either. I think the thing that really sticks with me was how I didn't run as fast as I could have. The whole time my girlfriend and I were running, I was trying to keep my body between her and the shooter, thinking something like, if anyone was going to get hit, I wanted it to be me and not her. I'm not saying that to sound heroic, it was purely out of instinct. I just remember the skin crawling sensation that came with it though, slowing myself down when I wanted to sprint off through the trees, all while hoping that I didn't get shot, and then hoping that if I did get shot, the bullet wouldn't go through me and hit my girlfriend too. She was amazing by the way. She ran like the wind and stayed as quiet as possible and she didn't even start to slow down until we were safely back across the tracks. Without a shadow of a doubt, those were the most terrifying few minutes of my entire life. If it was just me on my own, or maybe me with like a guy friend, it would have been scary all the same. But with it being my girlfriend with me, for some reason that made it all the more terrifying. I guess there was just that natural instinct to protect her, but at the same time, I knew that if push came to shove, I wouldn't be able to protect her from a guy with a gun, especially if that person wanted to do us harm. The best I could do was try to shield her, and I'm proud of myself for doing that, but it still made for a terrifying few minutes. We ended up getting out of there safely, and we called the cops as soon as we were able, but I don't know anything about the person who got shot, and as far as I know, their killer has never been caught. Back in like 2011, I tried to organize a camping trip for myself and a few friends. They had been talking all spring about how awesome it'd be if we all went camping together. Just a bunch of dudes, no phones, just living in the moment, all that kind of stuff. But then, as it came closer and closer to the date, each of the four dudes dropped out one by one, citing various reasons as to why they couldn't attend. And obviously, it sucked. I was super stoked for some kind of crazy adventure, and I'd also invested what, at the time, was a ton of money in all the clothing and gear I thought I needed. I was kind of heartbroken that the trip was basically set to be cancelled, but then it occurred to me, why not just go on my own. We planned the trip for mid-July, which is easily the best time to camp in the far northeast, meaning it was very much a case of stick to the date or possibly wait a whole year for the opportunity to resurface. So I packed my stuff and on the day that we were due to depart, off I went on my lonesome for a few days camping in Acadia National Park. For the three days that I was there at the time of my life, I actually figured that I might regret going solo, that I'd be bored out of my skull for the duration, but I couldn't have been more wrong. First off, I barely had a moment to myself. Between making camp, collecting enough firewood, setting up the bear alarms, and then getting the fire going, I literally did not have a spare moment until sundown. Then, when it did finally go down, I was in no mood to relax. Nighttime in the woods is freaking scary, dude. And since I was my first night in the woods in probably 10 years, and I was on my own, it was just a lot to get used to in a very short space of time, at least if I wanted any sleep anyway. I got used to the night sounds in the end, and there's only so many times that you can play that scene from the Blair Witch Project in your head before it just it gets kind of old, you know? And so after that, the second and third night were way easier and I managed to actually get some decent bouts of sleep. Then on the third and final night of my trip, I woke up in the middle of the night in some serious discomfort. There's also no delicate way to put this, so I'll just be real blunt about it. I didn't poop for three whole days while I was out there. 
Every time I even thought about it, I'd picture a snake slithering up, me having to abort and either getting poop all over me or getting my butt bitten by a gardener steak or something. There aren't any venomous steaks up here in Maine, but they'll still bite you if the mood takes them, so the idea of dropping trowel and squatting someplace wasn't in the least bit appealing to me, but I could only put it off for so long. I was almost constantly busy or on the move, at least during daylight hours anyway, and that meant that I needed to eat a lot. But then, the more I ate, the more I needed to take a dump until I finally reached the point where I couldn't hold it in anymore. I got up, put my headlamp on the tactical settings so that it emitted a, just a little blue light, it's harder to spot, and then walked off into the woods with my wet wipes. I didn't walk far, but I didn't exactly want to poop right next to where I was planning on eating breakfast the next morning either, so I must have walked for at least a minute or two trying to find the perfect spot before finally leaning up against a tree and dropping my pants. I promise. That is enough poop talk for the remainder of the story. Just know that everything went smoothly, maybe not the best choice of words, and I managed to wipe and pull my pants up before starting on the walk back to my camp. But literally, just as I'm about, I don't know, 80 to 90 feet away, I see another person's flashlight shining up near my camp. The sudden appearance of this other person in the middle of the goddamn night obviously sent major alarm bells ringing in my head, and obviously there were a handful of innocent explanations, but there were way more not so innocent ones too. So instead of just walking back up to my camp to see what this mysterious stranger wanted, I switched off my headlamp real quick and then crept over to a tree trunk in the darkness and watched from behind it. Some of you might be thinking, why the dim blue light? Well. If you've given yourself night blindness by using a big bright flashlight like my visitor was, it's almost impossible to detect that real dim shade of blue. And that's why I was able to turn my headlight lamp off real quick without being seen. Anyway, so I duck behind a tree, watching as this guy's flashlight beam is just sort of moving around my camp. I can't see the guy holding it, not in any sort of great detail anyway, but I could see that he was shining his flashlight on different stuff like he was inspecting my camp or looking for something. Seconds later, I see a second flashlight appear, meaning two people were now walking around my campsite. The second flashlight seemed to follow the same pattern as the first for a minute, before the two strangers stopped inspecting my camp and started talking to each other. Now I couldn't hear every word, but I heard enough to know that they were looking for me, specifically. One guy asked the other a question and his reply was just a little louder when he said, He was just here. Now hearing those words made for one of the creepiest moments of my entire life. I get that two guys might just randomly stumble across a campsite after dark. That's not entirely out of the question. But then to know that at least one of them had been watching me somehow, that made me feel sick to my stomach. I felt perfectly capable of defending myself, but only against things I could see, and things that didn't creep up on me in the middle of the night when I should have been sleeping. You also gotta remember that I put down a bunch of little bear alarms which are basically trip wires with a noisemaker on the end, and those guys made it up to my camp without triggering a single one. Sure they had flashlights, but those things aren't easy to see if you don't know they're there, even in broad daylight. I watched the two flashlights for a few minutes longer, trying to figure out what the two men were saying. I could barely make out a word, but then I heard one of them say something like, we'll just come back tomorrow. A few more words were exchanged and then the two guys turned and walked away from my campsite. I stayed put for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, internally debating on what I should do. In my head, I was almost certain that the two guys, or at least one of them, would go back to wherever they were watching me from and then return the second I showed up at my camp again. I wanted nothing more than to just run back to camp, pack my stuff away and then get the hell out of there before dawn. But that first thought stopped me. Packing up camp would make way more noise than I was comfortable making, and there was also no way that I'd be able to do that without cranking my headlamp up, which in turn would make it much easier to see me and this was also assuming that the two strangers didn't have some kind of night vision capability. 
Now I know that sounds like I was overthinking the whole thing, but I literally had nothing else to do. I was just stuck there in the darkness, barely breathing, not moving. All I had were my thoughts and my fears, nothing else. I stayed exactly where I was for what seemed like forever, and then I finally started to see dawn approaching, and I felt safe enough to creep back up to my camp and start to dismantle it. I did it as quickly and quietly as possible. Then, instead of having some breakfast like I planned to before departure, I walked all the way back to where I'd left my car. This took me way longer than it would have done under any other circumstances too because I made a huge effort not to stick to any regular trails. I also made a point of stopping at the information center on the way off the island where I asked if any of the rangers had come across a campground in the middle of the night. They didn't have a clue what I was talking about. No rangers had been patrolling the park after dark and if they had been, there's no way they'd have just walked up on some sleeping campers like that. Since the rangers also handle law enforcement in the parks, I was invited to file a report and give as much detail as possible. If folks were creeping up on campers in the middle of the night, the rangers damn sure wanted to know about it, but as much as I appreciated their concern, I wasn't exactly filled with the kind of confidence that made me want to revisit Acadia anytime soon. I'd say the most life-threatening thing I'd ever faced was during a solo camping trip back in late June of 2012. For those of you that either don't remember, weren't in West Virginia at the time, or have otherwise never heard of them, the region gets these crazy summer storms every couple of years that folks call the Rachos. I'm terrible at explaining these types of things, so here's just the definition from weather.gov. A derecho is a widespread, long-lived windstorm that's associated with a band of rapidly moving showers or thunderstorms. Although a derecho can produce destruction similar to the strength of tornadoes, the damage typically is directed in one direction along a relatively straight swath. By definition, if the wind includes gusts of at least 58 miles per hour or greater along most of its length, then the event may be classified as a derecho. If you consider that the mildest form hurricane has wind speeds of like 70 plus miles per hour, you start to understand that the Rachel is basically like a baby hurricane. They can be dangerous, but to most people they're little more than an annoyance. But then, imagine solo camping in the middle of West Virginia, seeing the skies darken and realizing the wind is strong enough to uproot dead or dying trees, and you start to understand why I got so scared being there. Luckily, as I was searching for a safe place to camp that night, I came across a kind of man-made shelter. It was really little more than a single walled concrete pavilion which didn't do much to keep the wind and rain off of me, but in the event of a falling tree close by, I knew that it might just be the difference between losing my life or not. But then apparently, and very unfortunately for me, I wasn't the only thing in the forest to have that same idea. About an hour before sundown, with the wind still howling in the trees, I heard that sort of thumpity thump of something heavy running towards the shelter. I couldn't see what it was at first, nor did I hear the thing until the last second because of the wind and how the shelter was positioned. A second later, I was barely on my feet when it came hurtling around the corner of the shelter. It was a black bear. The storm had scared it out of its wits which is very bad news for me. My first reaction was obviously to roar and wave my arms around like a crazy person trying to be even scarier than the storm, but as you can probably guess, that was much easier said than done. The bear saw me and jumped back in fright and then appeared to keep on running in the direction it was going. But then all it did was loop around the blind side of the shelter then come tearing back around the same side I first saw it basically in a rough circle. I did the same thing I did the first time, jumping up and down and screaming like a madman until it ran off again, but then for a second time, all it did was loop back around. It obviously wanted the shelter. It was just weighing up whether I was worth fighting or not, and the scary thing was that every time it looped back around, it got closer and closer. 
After a few more loops, I heard its claws clacking on the concrete just a few feet in front of me, like it was that close, and the huffs and puffs of anger and confusion it was making were equally terrifying. It was getting closer with each loop, until in the end, I had to back off to keep from coming within clawing distance, Then the more I backed off, the more ground I gave it until suddenly it darted into the shelter and took a swipe at me before backing off for another loop. At that point, I grabbed my backpack to use as a kind of improvised shield for the next time it came in for an attack, and I had it by the straps and it still had most of my gear in it so it was still pretty heavy and I was planning on using it like a battering ram too. If the bear rushed me again, I'd thrust my pack towards it too, hopefully giving it enough of a scare to deter it from any further assaults. My heart was in my mouth as it came around for that next pass, and when it did, it once again looked like it was about to dash into the shelter a little to try and take a swipe at me. But then, I guess the sight of me holding my pack like that, the way it changed my size and shape and appearance, that gave the bear enough of a scare to back off altogether. It didn't even head in for a second attack. It just sort of roared a little, did a kind of 360 as it must have been thinking, what the hell, and then ran off in the direction it first came. The thing to do after that would have been to get the hell away from the shelter because the bear was most probably going to come back, right? But then, where the hell was I supposed to go? Pretty much every second I was out in those woods with no sort of shelter, I was at a solid risk of being squished by some falling tree, but every minute I continued to stay in the shelter was one that I was at risk of a bear attack. If something happened to me in the woods, something which meant that I couldn't walk or even run, then the bear might just catch up with me and inflict some serious, real damage. But if I stayed in the shelter and used that same tactic of using my backpack as a shield, then I might just withstand another bear attack. I guess that might seem crazy to some people, but I was actually fairly confident that it wouldn't come back. But I was absolutely certain that at least a handful of trees would be uprooted by the wind and come crashing down on the forest floor, and there was no scaring one of those off by waving my pack around. And that's why I opted to stay in that shelter, even though it meant a sleepless and thoroughly terrifying night in the storm. A few years back, my boyfriend and I were on a camping trip last summer in Arkansas. The first few days were real nice and then late one afternoon, we were casually grilling some dinner when we heard someone loudly yelling for help. It sounded like it was coming from a few campsites over, just out of sight but close enough to hear so me and my boyfriend booked it over to the source of the yelling and then we're faced with something that looked straight out of a horror movie. Some guy is leaning against a camp table with a huge gash across his stomach. Apparently he'd been walking along, knife in hand, and then he tripped and stabbed himself so deep that he was gushing blood. We laid him down. My boyfriend tried to put pressure on the wound and then I pulled out my cell phone, only to find that I didn't have service. The only hospital was maybe 20 miles away, so even if I did have bars, it was going to be a while before anyone reached us. And that's when my boyfriend had the idea to ask the guy where the keys to his truck were. He tells us where and I went to grab them then the next minute, we're hauling this guy onto the back of his truck then driving off in the direction of the nearest hospital. The whole situation was made infinitely more terrifying for me personally because at that point we had quite a bit of blood on us and blood has always made me extremely squeamish. I've gotten a bad cut on my hand before now ran it under a faucet in the kitchen and then woke up on the floor moments later. I see blood. I pass out. So I had no other option but to drive so that my boyfriend could continue keeping pressure on the guy's wound. If I'd have stayed back in the truck bed with him, I'd have passed out and maybe fallen out of the truck bed and if our guy bled to death in the back there, there'd be two funerals. But then if I passed out at the steering wheel, we'd all be dead or severely injured at the very least. I tried to raise that point with my boyfriend, but 
I guess it was him being protective that had him imploring me to drive and keep my eyes on the road and not on the guy's blood. He told me to pull over if I felt woozy or anything, but I think the pure adrenaline saw me through and we made it to the hospital in exactly 12 minutes. My boyfriend later said that we arrived just as the guy was beginning to slur his words and whatnot, which was obviously a very bad sign. Any longer in the back of that truck, and he might not have been conscious when we arrived, which, as anyone with any medical background will tell you, is a place you don't want to be. I remember when the hospital staff opened up the back of the guy's truck to pull him out, and there was this huge pool of blood underneath him, and my boyfriend and my boyfriend's pants were completely soaked with it. Once the injured man was safely handed over, we drove his truck back to our campsite and ended up having to watch his dog as we tried our best to have something that resembled a normal evening again, which was obviously impossible. The next morning, the guy's brother showed up to collect his things and thankfully told us that he'd survived his ordeal and was going to be okay. It was deeply emotional. If you've ever had someone thank you for saving the life of a loved one, you'll know just how intense and humbling an experience it is. The guy had a huge lump in his throat, as did we, and we wished him all the best after helping him pack away his brother's gear. All in all, it was a horrifying situation, but we saved a man's life, so not only did we have a happy ending, but it's something that brought me and my now husband much closer together and became a memory we'll never forget. A few years back, I decided to go camping with about 10 other friends at Snively Hot Springs in eastern Oregon on Friday the 13th, which also just so happened to be a full moon. The drive out there took a little over an hour, and since I had work the next day, I decided I wasn't going to drink much so I wouldn't be hungover in the morning. And so, we arrive, set up camp in a nice spot away from the majority of other campers, and then we started cracking open the beers. After that, we took a dip in the nearby springs, and then after sundown, we went on a night walk to enjoy the mountains illuminated by the full moon and the stars. It was really dark at this point, and people dipped out, so only a few of us ended up actually going on this night walk. Now, side note, the three of us that went had all been microdosing mushrooms pretty much the majority of the night. Things were slightly trippy, but... I don't like to get super glonky and or unaware of my surroundings. So, it's the four of us, myself, two friends, and one of my friend's dogs. We're walking uphill for about ten minutes, flashlights lighting the way before us when we suddenly take a right onto a trail. We didn't even make it three minutes without hearing some very loud and very close rustling in front of us. We stop on our tracks and my friend in the front of the line starts scanning the area with his flashlight. Have you ever seen a big cat's eyes in the dark? The way they glow is chilling, especially when the cat is bigger than you. So when I tell you I have never been so scared in my life, I mean it with all my heart and soul. And so, we're face to face with a big old mountain lion. It's not more than a few yards in front of us. An instinct kicks in for all of us and we just back away slowly. My friend's dog, on the other hand, had an instinct of its own and ran off to the right of us into the woods, but the mountain lion didn't cash in on her. It kept those glowing eyes glued directly on us. We continued to back away until we can't back away anymore, and sure enough, we see the dog is right next to us, in which case, what had we heard running up behind us? We shine the flashlight and holy crap, another freaking mountain lion, only this one we figured was her baby. On the other side of the fence was someone else's campsite and we had no choice but to turn around and jump it. We got the dog over first and then jumped it and ripped all of our clothing in the process with my friend cutting his leg pretty bad. And so, we're in someone else's campsite on Friday the 13th under a full moon in the mountains tripping on some shrooms completely lost. We don't know where the people are but we don't care. We got into their unlocked car and honked the horn for about a minute to scare off the cougars. We made sure to clearly yell and let any and everybody around us know that we weren't robbers and that there were cougars close by. 
We got out after a couple of minutes and were pretty weirded out that nobody came out to check on their campsite. My friend swore that she could hear someone screaming or trying to scream, but her boyfriend insisted that we needed to leave the campsite. Part of me believed her, though I didn't hear any noises, but I was also ready to just GTFO away from that area. We found the exit of their campsite and on the way back to ours I said my final prayers, and I'm not even religious. We got back to camp and every rustling noise around me had me convinced that we were being stalked by these cougars. I had a full-fledged panic attack in the car for about an hour and was absolutely covered in gnats because of the sunroof being cracked. Everyone else was having fun around the campfire, even the other two who had just gone through the same experience I had. I was hung over as all hell the next morning, no showed my job and got fired when I got back into town actually, which sucked but I didn't give a single F, I was just happy to be alive. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 7pm EST, and there are some super fun live streams every Sunday and Wednesday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, or over email and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, Grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks for members of the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, Tiny Hammer do be hitting windshields. <laughs>